What is up, college baseball fans? Welcome to another episode of the 11.7 Podcast. This is the Omaha, let's just call it the College World Series recap episode with Jack DeLong Shaw. Flops on the ground, pencil talk, taking over the world. Um, I wanted to get this episode out today. Um, Dimitri is out at the field in Italy right now. Uh, we will do a season recap episode. Like with everything, uh, the timing just didn't work up or work out with, you know, my new job and with Jack's traveling. Like Jack's got 27 hours in an RV on the way home to Charleston. So we wanted to hit this pretty quick uh, the morning after Tennessee takes home the national championship. And he happens to be in the Tennessee hotel right now. So you might see some familiar faces passing behind him or in front of him. Uh, and they, they did a really, really, they did a really cool thing, like kind of embracing you since day one, like really the fall and uh, let you create as much content as you wanted, which is just cool for us. Now there's plenty of other teams that did the same thing, but you know, as those teams got eliminated, it was like, all right, we're going to attach ourselves to a team that, um, you know, gave you free reign, free access to their players, the staff, facilities, and everything. So this episode, Jack's going to talk about um, everything that happened in Omaha uh, and his favorite stories, favorite people he got to meet, and just, you know, shout out to the people that deserve shout outs. So um, it'll be more of a Q&A style than, I like uh, that. than that. So Jack, I want you first, before we dive into anything, I want you to shout out your sponsors that help pay for the trip and Dude. help uh, support you and your, your endeavors over there in Omaha. So I know there's a few of them. So I want you to yep. go floor and give them a quick shout out here up front. Well, hey, I want the guys that are right above us if you're watching at home. Home Field Apparel, like, not only are they taking over the world with their sweet vintage retro look, like I saw their stuff all over Omaha this week. So clearly they're doing something right. And, and how lucky are we to have them in our corner that they believe in what we're doing? to partner with a group that's clearly taking off the moon. So like, especially Josh with home field apparel, like I'm a small little entity inside this monster behemoth that is 11.7. Josh says, no, I want to be involved. Like let's do the damn thing. So shout out to home field apparel, uh, use code CWS 24. I talk, <laughs> Josh is going to be stoked. Uh, hopefully there's going to be a lot of people that follow through. If you're a Tennessee volunteer fan and you're listening today, their national championship gear is stupid like i'm not saying not to go to the ncaa i'm just telling you if you want that retro look there's no better place to go commemorate your first national championship in college baseball than with home field apparel um i want to also shout out sucker punch a lot of sleepless nights sweat my tail off in the teal ninja in my rv um sucker punch is the best hydration most electrolytes in any drink on the planet that's just a fact uh, if you're a pickle juice fan like myself or just want to like try to take care of your body, body's a temple, as I like to say, go show Sucker Punch some love. Uh, and then on top of that, um, my guys over at Chinook Seeds, I, there's a reason they put best seeds on the planet on those seeds. And uh, man, guys like Brandon or Mark, like they, they were so unbelievable to me this week. So I thank them um, for allowing this chip. Look at Ben, product placements. Always stay needle. strapped. Always stay strapped. I have I've completely addicted to the cinnamon toast crunch ones, which I want it's to put so good, in. dude. It, it is, is so good. It is unbelievable. Never in my wildest dreams would I have thought that sweet flavored sunflower seeds would be a thing. Oh my god, dude! I want like cotton candy flavored now. I want <laughs> I want apple pie flavored. Like, give me sweet sunflower seeds. It, they're so good. They're so good. And and what's cool is this is something uh, their owner Mark was telling. He started this thing nine years ago in a market that's pretty like dominated, dominated. Yeah. they've completely taken it over they're everywhere they were all over omaha there's a reason that they're in every single one of these college dugouts so chinook was huge uh and then my final shout out is a personal one to me harmony sports the nielsen family they allowed me to take the teal ninja out and show some love and continue to chase this dream they're wildly entrepreneur that doesn't come necessarily natural to me so for them to push this i guess this idea ben and i you talk about it all the time if you're listening along and you understand that college baseball has grown, but it's tough to make a living in, our currency in life right now is adventure and experience, dude. I, this last two week is enough currency that I could hope for in a lifetime. So uh, to the Nielsen's, to Harvey, uh, I say thank you. And we kick it back to home field because, Ben, dude, these shirts are just silly sick. Dude, this, this uh, the Tennessee Baseball 2024 National Champs Ringer Tee, 
this one right here in the middle, just it's the most perfect shirt. Like I want to see this style shirt every year from now on. Like whoever wins the national championship gets this style shirt. It's incredible. Like the new hats they launched are awesome. Um, obviously, they had the baseball and softball pullovers that we, we promoted pretty heavily. The snapbacks, like the Tennessee collection is really cool. It, and they they just continue to put out more and more and more. Uh, shout out to Homefield. You, you mentioned Josh from Homefield, right? And yep. he he sent me a text like late last night. Like he was up watching the game. He's a Georgia Bulldog fan, but he's a college baseball guy at heart. Um, but he just said, congrats on a fantastic year, brother. Can't wait to run it back with you all bigger and better next year. Uh, so, like, kind of behind the scenes for all the 11.7 listeners, Homefield took a big chance on us this year. Uh, obviously, they're much bigger and just have, like, a loyal following in the college football industry and basketball uh, and then, like, NASCAR, things like that. They really have never thought or even attempted to think about college baseball. And we painted them this picture. I remember Jack, me, Dimitri, we were all on a Zoom call with uh, with Josh probably back in January. We painted them a picture. We're like, look, this is a sport that it is still considered like a niche sport. It's growing every single year. And those same fan bases from college football and college basketball are finally, like over the last couple of years, adopting baseball as their springtime sport. And it, it trickles into the summer. It's it, it kind of bridges the gap to the next football season. And especially in the power four or five conferences, like these teams are investing money. Like just trust us. Like let's do an awesome uh, prize pack for Omaha. And like we, we just paint them the whole picture. Right. And it took them less than an hour to say yes. They're like, all right, we'll get back to you. Like this is awesome information. Thank you so much. Within the next hour, they're like, yep, we're going to do it. Like, you guys just tell us what to do. They were, they were obviously there's a lot of different ways to run businesses, but the way that they conduct business and the way that they're so easygoing and like trust their, you know, their clients and, and people that are promoting them, it, it was really cool to work with. So shout out to Homefield. Um, they have over, I think, close to 200 teams now. And uh, it, it's just a really it's a good place to buy your, your apparel. And it's officially licensed and a lot of retro looks. So y'all go check out Homefield one last time um but yeah let's just make this a, a cool q a episode all right jack like i know you have stories for days there's stories you can't tell on air i understand that uh, but we're going to talk about moments all eight teams that were there all eight uh fan bases people you got to meet and things like that so we'll kind of work backwards here we're going to start with last night's game like last night's game although i'm a much bigger fan of a friday saturday sunday no yeah, national championship series. The turnout for Monday was pretty solid compared to other Mondays in the past that they've had it on. Or shout out 2016 when they had it like at noon on a Wednesday or whenever it was uh, when Coastal Carolina beat Arizona. But yeah, like it felt like the stadium was packed. Um, there wasn't this like, at least watching on TV, there wasn't this crazy atmosphere because I think both the fan bases were more nervous than excited. Ter terrified. Like, terrified, right? Like, they were just like, because both fan bases obviously haven't won, you know, a, a national championship. At, like, for a &M, it's for a major championship, it's been, like, almost 100 years. And then for Tennessee, it's been, like, since the 90s, right? Um, or I don't really know, but it feels yeah, like the you're 90s. Spot on. You're spot and, on. and both fan bases kind of have this, this aura around them, like, when are things going to, like, slip up? When are we going to make a mistake? And that's kind of what the, the vibes that I got um, – watching the game on TV. It was like both fan bases were holding their breath and just waiting for the big mistake to happen. And uh, but I could be completely wrong. So walk us through the environment from like the morning when you showed up to the stadium, got to do your interviews and this and that to like the final inning when all the drama was going on. No, I, and I think I think that that's a conversation that is going to be had this idea that it should have been Friday, Saturday, Sunday, right? Just to make it easier on the fans, right? Like there's a reason that those early games are so sold out because as a fan base, you're guaranteed to see your team play twice. Now, if we're going to reward those said fans, like, we got to take care of them. Like, I understand that you're taking the day off either way, but Friday, Saturday, Sunday, much cleaner. I was petrified of a, of a daytime dog pile. Like, it, that, that doesn't feel right on Sunday. So, yeah. to get that game in the night was really interesting because there was this idea. Sorry, I don't know if this is really loud behind me, but fans, I'm in, a, I'm in a Starbucks. We're letting it rip. Um, 
but but showing up to the ballpark Monday, it was like this really eerie calmness. Whereas Saturday, Sunday, they were just boozing everywhere, right? Like people getting after it. Monday was eerie, right? I talked to Kirby Connell's dad actually, and he was like this idea of win lose like this is it and like that's emotional for a lot of these guys right like I, I would be willing to venture that anyone that's listening to this i know ben and i can attest that last game and you know it's the last game is the weirdest like emotional roller coaster so almost for both teams in game two like there's that possibility of coming back tomorrow win lose like no matter what but for game three and for guys that are at the peak the pinnacle of their baseball career playing for a national championship with heightened emotions, but also deep down going, everything is a last. Every time I, I, I walk off the bus and I lace them up. So that was the energy, not just in the fans, right? But in the players too, where like, it literally gives me goosebumps talking about, cause I can feel that. I did it at a, in a, at a freaking ballpark in Fairfax, Virginia, not in front of 40,000 people and another 2 million at home watching. Can you imagine what that must like, that weight on your shoulders. So you're spot on, right? Add the fact that it was legitimately 105 degrees yesterday, right? There is this eerie, almost, all right, let's do the damn thing. First pitch and you can feel everyone like, oh God, oh God. Except for Xander Seacrest of Tennessee. All of a sudden he's locked in. And all of a sudden that Tennessee dugout goes, our guy's good. Us ready to roll. His energy and his passion and his joy that he brings to the game was so contagious yesterday. Um, he, dude, I and, can just yeah. tell you right now, Xander Seacrest would have been one of my favorite teammates to have because he's no the perfect mix, right? Like off the field, he is like goofy and funny, and like he's just kind of like the, the locker room guy. But you can see him flip that switch, right? And like as a player, like a teammate of that guy. Like when you see a goofy, you know, funny dude flip a switch, you're like, all right, if, if it means this much to him, like we need to be twice as focused. And uh, like you can just tell, like he was built for the big moment. And dude, he was great. Uh, so great. And, I, and I'll, I'll put a pin in that because on the other dugout, right? Hayden shot of, of AM all week just kept telling me, man, like, I, how cool is this? I get to play my, I get to play in the Charles Schwab field with my best friends. I get to play with my best friends. There was a reason that those two teams were playing. Yes, they're uber talented. They loved each other more than anyone in this turn. Like that, that is that was so evident to me. So I go back to the Kirby situation. Tennessee has had really, really talented teams in the last three, four years. Really talented. I don't know why this team was the one to do it because of their leadership council, right? Anybody who's been in those dugouts understands that, like, sometimes, like, the best player, like, carries themselves as the best player. Not this team. Like, truthfully, not this team. Like, talking to Evan Ashenbeck of Texas and he's like, we didn't let our freshmen be freshmen. We're too old. We were over that crap. Like they weren't allowed to. So when you look at Tennessee, this mantra two years ago of being the evil empire, right? When you're leaders, right? In the clubhouse, they don't always have to be guys that play. Right? They, they don't. They, and preferably sometimes they don't have to. But when they all of a sudden ball out too, like Kirby Connell, who is yeah. the leader in appearances in Tennessee history, he was a lefty lefty guy for most of his career. Xander Seacrest was a midweek starter, right? And he joked about it. Midweek lives matter. That's what we talked about last November. He yep. knew that was his role. He knew it. Then all of a sudden, when those guys, your culture guys, that whose energy is contagious, when like, hey, those guys can be loose, so can I. When those guys go crazy, you've got this unbelievable blend of like, uh-oh, this team's going to be a freaking steamroller because they never let the moment get too big. And it's exactly what we saw yesterday. That's why Xander Seacrest, I made a joke about – UT Medical Center in about nine to 12 months is going to have 30 to 40 newborn babies named Xander, right? Because he's the he's the all-American kid that played like an all-American the last two months of the season. There was no statistically nobody better on the mound than Xander Seacrest. And what an unbelievable story and tip of the cap for him to call out a career. Kirby Connell getting that big leverage moment in the eighth. Like it just was so storybook for this team of destiny. Yeah, and I, I want to piggyback off of everything you just said. Because, like, one of the biggest storylines in college baseball is Tennessee finally broke that 25-year curse of the number one overall national seed winning the whole thing. And and how I'm piggybacking it is, dude, like, not always the most talented teams win this tournament. In fact, it's very rare, right? Um, I think there's an exception. Like, last year, LSU 
one of the most right. talented teams. They just weren't the number one overall seed because they, you know, had a, a rough patch. But going back to my point, like it takes not only the most talented teams that can do it in the regular season, but like let's go do it in front of forty thousand people at Charles Schwab. Like, like the big moments will be there. And and dude, without the guys like Xander Seacrest uh, and, and the mayor and and like some of the role players that were never looked at, like throughout the regular season they were never looked at like oh this guy's gonna pitch at the next level or this guy's for sure a first rounder like these are guys that might be senior signs like they might go have a major league career but it'll probably be out of the bullpen or like a number four or five starter like they're not the chase burns or the paul skeens of the world so it, it takes those role players and, and the leaders that you talk about to put it all together glue the whole team together and win the big game so uh tennessee breaks the curse of the number one overall seed and i think it's just the perfect mix, mix of the the super talented guys, the Blake Burks, the Christian Moores, the Billy Amix, uh, and then you and then mix that with the Cal Starks and the uh, I, it, it was just the perfect overall mix. And, and on top of all of that, to have, in my opinion, if not the number one coach in the country, like easily top three, four, or five, like easily top three or four or five, has a very strong argument to be the number one coach in the country. Um, I mean, it it just kind of felt like really since the tournament started like this is going to be the team that wins it so. I, here's the deal there have been a lot of people tell me that i've been glazed in this program and i probably have right he's the top two coach in the country and he sure as hell ain't too this guy listening to his players and his assistants and support staff and administration and fans talk about this guy you can't make that stuff up like yeah, sure. Like you can put on the coach speak and like, oh yeah, coach is great. No, watch how he interacts with everybody around him. It's so genuine. I know I said that word a hundred times in this podcast, but it's reason. You want to know why Blaze like Ben was like, we are loyal people, we ride or die with our people. He took a shot at me when no one else was, just like you guys have at eleven point seven. We go in November, right? They're the number one team in the country. They're the first team to ever done it. They were not that team in the preseason. Nobody like. Yeah. There's a, there's a tweet circulated right now, like, oh, are we expecting a huge Tennessee drop off? And like, look at all the players. They kept receipts and they're retweeting and sending back out today, right? It's not an accident. They heard the noise. They understood, oh, you think our star power's gone? Buckle up, look what we got in our back pocket, right? So there's this idea that, yeah, they may have been the number one seed in the tournament, but they sure as hell weren't that all year until late in the season where it became inevitable. So. Yeah. They played with that chip on their and, shoulder. And honestly, like the same exact story could be said about Texas A&M too. No doubt. No, yeah. Like talk no. about a team that, that didn't even make the, I don't even think they made the tournament last year. Maybe they did as like a three seed, but uh, like a team nobody was talking about. Like they were picked to finish like bottom half of the SEC. Nobody believed in them. And then the moment Braden Montgomery got hurt in the Super Regionals, there were people, maybe even myself, that picked Oregon to, to win the next game. You know what I mean? Like, you lose, a, you lose a guy like Braden Montgomery, but you actually get statistically better as a team offensively. Like, that's the kind of cool – that's the cool thing about college baseball versus a college no basketball or college football. Like, we saw what happened to Florida State when, when Devin Travis breaks his leg or whatever happened. Uh, like, they were not the same team. And, right. you know, they, they get blown out and this and that. They don't put up points. In college baseball, you lose your best player – there's always somebody there or like the whole team can step up and, and replace that guy. So A&M is in the same boat as, as Tennessee when it comes to teams that did not get the preseason hype. They did not have the love that maybe they deserved. And uh, they just put it together and put together a very good season, like from start to finish. Man, they, they were what Max Wiener did with that pitching staff from last year to this year is not miraculous, but it's revolutionary, right? Mm -hmm. Not that we're in this day and age where like the tough guy, old school style of coaching is different, but watching him go out and love on his guys, smiling ear to ear, he's sprinting from the dugout back and forth. He, he gave me one of the coolest sound bites right before the national championship on media day where um, he said, I, I think I've told this story before, so stop me if I have, but this idea of, I was talking to Evan Ashton back and uh, I said, hey, congratulations, man. Look, we'd love the interview. He's like, oh, we were warned about you. I go, yeah, what'd they say? And he's like, man, you're gonna ask crazy ass questions. Yeah, glad that the, glad the word's spreading. So Max Wiener, then the very next day, he goes, oh, I'd love the interview with Ashton. I said, thank you, appreciate it. 
I asked him, so are you kind of like tired of the noise? Like, would you rather just go and play? He's like, no, I'm not tired of it. It just becomes monotonous. You feel like you're giving the same answers. That's like why we kind of like love talking to you because you don't really know. It keeps on our toes a little bit. I go, so let, let me ask a cliche question. Like, why, why have your freshmen not been freshmen? What I asked Ash and Beck. And then also, like, what, what do you do in these moments to prepare? He's like, oh, dude, like, that's the question everyone asks, right? He's like, you can't. You just have to go experience it. Why would we try to, like, create a playbook for it? When it'll be a lot more fun to just go see what happens. And I was like, how does that not make all the sense in the world to, to 18 to 23-year-olds that, like, all, like, right, I got the yips bad. I put so much pressure on myself. When your guys in front of you, right, these leaders of men that are growing and shaping these dudes, create a blueprint and go, come on, man, not the biggest. Like, all of a sudden, then they're playing the, this is easy, right? It's so simplistic to see. That fires you up, right? Because there are people in the game that are changing it for the better. They're young, that get it, that are feel. Oh man, it it fired me up to talk to him and, and to understand. Like, no wonder they're here. Guys that are playing for these dudes love them. It was so easy to see. Yeah, it, it's like well known in the college baseball world that the the I think I mentioned it on the last podcast, but these two assistant coaching staffs uh, and like we can go into the other eight Omaha or other six Omaha teams, yeah. but like. A&M and Tennessee specifically, like between Michael Early, um, hitting coach for Texas A&M, who, shout out to him, he was our very first podcast guest back in 2019 when he was coaching the Bash Brothers at Arizona State. He's at A&M, one of the most likable guys in the country, right? And you, you got to see that in the ninth inning yesterday when Jace Lavalette uh, is down to two strikes, a borderline strike two call. You know, calls time and he goes talks to him and uh you can just see it on his face like this this moment is a big moment but he's not making it any bigger no. for the for the kids like no. he's he's there to depressurize the situation uh nolan kane another guy uh associate head coach at AM, he he called me before the season started and, and just was bragging about how this team had the chemistry he's never seen before and this is a guy that won the 2009 national championship with lsu as a player um, so he's like not too far removed as a player. So he still understands it. Max Wiener might have been the higher of the century in Max. college baseball. Like this guy is revolutionizing the sport in a day of age where everybody is so focused on velocity and fastball, fastball, wipeout sliders. Like he is a guy that you, you watch AM's pitching staff. They had very few guys throwing 94 miles an hour and higher. Like, they're getting outs with guys that are just able to mix and match pitches, uh, and he's able to maximize uh, each and every guy out there. And, and they throw strikes, right? So he's going to be a big name, a hot market ticket over the next five years to be, become a head coach. Um, and, and then, like, on the other side, like Josh Elander might be the nicest guy in college baseball. Like, we've seen him get fired up and get ejected from a couple games, like maybe last year, I think it was, or two years ago in Omaha. Um, but like he, like you, you sit and talk to him, like, oh, he played at TCU. Like he, he was a fun guy when he was a player. Uh, I mean, just Frank Anderson, the old guy, the old pitching coach, Dude. one of the, one of the most <laughs> legendary guys in college baseball. Like he is ride or die for his guys. Chris Stamos and Kirby Connell just walked by about 20 minutes ago wearing in Frank, we trust t-shirts, right? Exactly. Like. The players are bought in. It's not just Vitello and it's not just Schloss. Like, of course, they play a huge part in it, but it's the yeah. guys under them that they trust and the players trust and connect with. Like, the assistant yeah. coaching staffs get kind of overblown, or maybe it's on purpose. Like, maybe they don't get the recognition right. they deserve, but like those guys are just as important as any player or any other coach on the uh, on the team. Um, it, it feels like one of those, you know how they always go back and look at the uh, Washington uh, commanders or Redskins uh, like coaching tree and how they're all like yeah. head coaches in the NFL. This World Series, and I know you and I talked about it off air, is going to be that coaching tree, right? Like mm -hmm. they're all superstars in the making and they can all go be head coaches there. But like there's such buy-in right now in their current programs that like it's special to be a part of like Josh Elander on Sunday hitting fungos and stuff is wearing like a retro Blake Burke like graffiti art t-shirt. It's like, what are we doing here? He's got an arm sling on just rocking in fungos. I was like, this is, everyone's so cool here. What the hell? Like, Dude, and it's crazy because like college baseball used to be a sport dominated by the old like retirement right. age head coaches, right? Like you, you look at Augie Garrido and, and Wayne Graham and 
Mike Martin and those guys, like the legendary coaches used to run this sport and they used to run the game. Um, and in fact, it, like growing up in Houston, Texas, it, it, like in the peak of rice in Texas baseball was it was torture because every high school coach, every travel ball coach wanted to be like the Wayne Graham or the Augie Garrido. Like that was their goal. So it was like hard nose. Like we did the same workouts. Like It was tough. Now it's a young man's game. Like you look at coaches across the country, like fun fact, Jim Schlossnagel is only 53 years old. Like that means when he was at TCU, like in the early 2010s, like he was in his early forties. He was like the same age as Vitello. Um, everybody thinks Schloss is like a 60 year old guy, 70 year old guy. He's not, he's 53. Like he still is not old enough to retire with AARP. Like, you know what I mean? Like it, it is a young man's game. And like, I think that's what it takes nowadays with this new age of kids, right? Like they need a younger guy or like a father figure to, to relate to. And like, they don't necessarily re necessarily relate to the 75, 80 year old coach that everybody was used to back 20 years ago. We, we keep yeah we keep saying the word relate i think that's why the game is blowing up right because i've always said and we talked about before this year like this idea that i could take a big league baseball fan and i could get him to love college baseball instantaneously right i i i would almost guarantee guarantee for our 11.7 fans that i could take someone who hates sports and get them to fall in love with some of these storylines right that's why we were so thankful for home field apparel right there's a campfire of brewing. Let's pour some gasoline on the damn thing and go nuts. That's what's happening right now, right? These young coaches that get it, these superstars with the draft getting cut down that are playing college baseball they didn't before, all of a sudden, right, instead of being a high school draft guy, it's cooler to come represent a program and wear a brand and be proud of where you went to play school. For. Like, that's the overall, like, whelming, like, answer for not only these two, but all eight teams, right? North Carolina, I feel like Chapel Hill, like fan base, like has been like a little iffy waves this weekend, right? Like yep. I mean, the list goes on and on. So that was really what was coolest this week was to see, oh, like here it comes, like you're just slowly dumping on the gas. Nah, man, I'm asking you to turn it upside down. Let's go, let's get weird here. Yeah, I mean, like you look at teams like Florida State. I felt like they did that two years oh. ago when they hired Link Jarrett. Like, hey, yep. we the our campfire is almost out. Like instead yeah. of like look, instead of going to gather some wood and leaves and like try to get a lighter to start this, let's just get the, a tank of gasoline. Let's light it on fire. Clemson did the same thing with Eric Backage. Like those are guys that are instant, like flame lighters. Like they, and, and you see the fan bases follow, right? Like they have, you know, record attendance numbers for both of those programs this year. Uh, they both met, or I guess Clemson didn't make it to Omaha, but they easily could have. Um, like those are the type of things. So, I, I think this sport is in a really good place and obviously there's going to be a lot of changes and I'm sure you heard a, a, about a lot of it in Omaha, but like this sport is getting a little bit more commercialized and I think that's okay. Um, there's going to be tons of money poured into this sport. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of teams and schools investing in the sport and like hopefully that results in players not having to take out loans to play baseball and like yeah. five years ago, four years ago, you would look out on the field in Omaha and you're like, most of these kids are going to be in debt when their second elimination game happens. Like game's over. They don't have health insurance. Uh, like they're going to be in $60,000 debt. Now with NIL, it feels like a lot of these kids, especially these programs aren't paying for anything out of pocket. Uh, it seems like the education is taken care of, but like hopefully we can get to a point where, you know, scholarships, the limit gets raised. Uh, NIL is used for good and not evil. And you're able to get good coaches, right? Like that was another problem with college baseball 10 years ago was the pay was so bad. And like, it's, it still is in some court, like parts. So you look at a job posting, you need an assistant coach, $25,000 salary plus housing. Like, and that's at the D1 level. Obviously A&M and these uh, Tennessee and everybody at the College World Series, like they're making decent money. But to get like that professional level coach, uh, a guy that's, been at the, for the Minnesota Twins or the Seattle Mariners and say, hey, I will actually make more money and be able to develop kids the way I want to. Like, let me go coach in college. And like, it, it's just stacking on top of each other. Like every little move is good for the sport. So um, there's a few things that need to be ironed out, I, I believe, but that we'll save it for a different episode. But as far as like a viewer, you were boots on the ground in Omaha as a viewer of TV at my house watching every pitch in Omaha. I loved it. It was one of my favorite college world series 
to watch. Yeah. It really was. I think everything was done like to to the best of ESPN and and everybody's ability. It was good. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the the coolest part. So you think back to like that those opening two days where it's just like we're high on life. Like you get three walk offs yeah. in a row walk and then game walk four is off, a home run off home run robbery by La Violette. Like the other really cool part of it, like the the awesome integral pieces in this bad boy whether it be CAGs, whether it be Mike Monaco, like these superstar human beings are awesome human beings. And I'm not saying like in the past that wasn't the case, but I feel like as someone who shared a dugout with like unbelievable players, sometimes like there's this like air of like, I'm the man, cockiness and swagger. There's been none of that out here. And I would tell you straight up, like all these interviews with these kids, they're so humble. Like that, yep. I feel like that's rare, and I feel like that has changed in recent times. So the NIL piece that you kind of went to, like getting to interact with these dudes, is is different because they might put on that persona on the field. That's something in their brain that they channel, and I think it's I'm clearly talking about Tennessee, right? But off the field, like they're totally different beasts, right? A and M, same kind of song and dance. Like Jason Laviolette is like the most soft spoken, like excitable kid. Grahovich is the most. Is the least looking freshman of all time. Yeah, I need a like birth certificate, I man. <laughs> I said I, t- I tweeted that out. I said birth certificate. I don't buy it. This dude's unreal. So, yeah, but I mean, it was the same thing with when we met with like the the Kentucky guys at, at Hoover, yeah. right? Like Trey Poozer and Ryan Waldschmidt, like these dogs on the field. Yeah. They're just like cracking up and just like hanging out uh, off the field, like doing interviews. Sure, we'll do a jersey swap, whatever. Like this is, yeah. it, it is contagious throughout the sport. And like the reason why, this is like a peel back the curtain moment. Like the reason why it's so contagious is because of what's happening right now. Kids go off and play summer ball, and like they're on teams with, you know, a, a roster of twenty five guys in summer ball might have fifteen to twenty teams represented, and like you know. They become friends and then they get acquaintances and friends of friends. Uh, all the teams hang out in summer ball. So it's like it, you, you kind of get to mix and match and share what each program culture is like. And then it becomes like a blend. So it's a trickle down effect. Uh, I mean, no other sport, to my knowledge, does anything like summer ball where kids play together from different sports. Like imagine if in college football, uh, you yeah. know, you had a, a, a spring league where they all played on different teams. Like It would be cool. Yeah. It just never would happen, right? It's not happening. Um, yeah. But yeah, uh, look, I think so. I, I, I'm trying to save a little bit of what's in my brain for our like season no, recap brief, episode. Yeah, I know. I know we just did a little bit of that, but like, yeah. I can't, you know, we, we can't help ourselves. Like, it's so yeah, we could go on, like, and I mean this truthfully. Uh, this is our sixth season doing it as 11.7. Uh, this is Jack's first time with us, but he's been doing it before us as well. This was my favorite season since 2019 to like follow and uh, like just watch games, interact with players, coaches, things like that. People around college baseball, like writers and uh, people on TV, radio hosts, like it was my favorite season from start to finish. And like I, I truthfully believe it. I think this is a, and I think next year might be better. And I really do. Like, it, just the competitiveness. And I know there's going to be conference re- realignment next year. There won't be a Pac-12. It'll be different. But as far as the support and the the excitement around the game, like this was this was by far just an incredible season. So, Not even close. Yeah. Um, but anyways, let's go back to Omaha here for a little bit. We'll stay on for another 10, 15 minutes or so, and then I'll let you go. Um, I want you to tell us about like maybe what was like the what was the moment for you where you're like, like wow, like maybe not I made it, but like wow, I, people or taking me more seriously than last year. Yeah, dude, I, that's a good point. Um, there were probably a couple, right? I, I think we talked about it a little bit off air. I had this, and I, I mentioned the last podcast, and I'll do it briefly so I don't ramble. There was like this opposite of imposter syndrome, right? Like I love telling these stories, but to interact with you guys, the 11.7 fans, that was like almost my you made it moment. Like I really do sometimes treat these in my brain like a diary. Like it's just you and I like chop it up. I forget people listen. So to interact with the dudes that were like, oh, I've been a listener since 2020. I've been a listener since 2022. Oh man, it's so cool you've been on board this year. That was almost in a weird way my my I made it moment. So um, from a from a like an actual like reporting um, sense, for me it would probably be 
this idea that last year was proof of concept. So like being in the media room and being like interacting with these coaches and I like, get him to trust. It's been a full year of cultivating those relationships. Look, it took a lot of time. It took a lot of work. Yeah. Um, so to show up, and, and my only connection with AM is Braden Montgomery from his time at Stanford last year. And for those guys to go, oh, dude, we love the brand right now. A lot of it is because their relationships with you. But like for teams that I haven't met yet to be so on board, that's pretty cool. I, I know people thought I was rooting for the balls heavily. And I told you, I, my loyalty to them back from November was so cool. Anim clinches a spot in the national championships and I'm on the field and their fans are chanting pencil guy. I don't tell the story and I haven't released the video because I don't want to seem like an egomaniac. That's enough to make a grown man cry. Like yeah. this dumbass dude with a flop and a pencil. Like, and I got fans that like are truly loving the behind the scenes. That's super special. So those moments with fans that get to interact, with, that was really special to me. Um, Jack, I'm going to pause you here, man. I have probably 40 to 50 DMs on the 11.7 Twitter account that are just people raving about you. Like, no. dude, ran into the pencil guy, like, love what he's doing. Like, this is so cool. You know, I asked him for a pencil or I asked him for a picture or like my son took a picture with him. Like, you were a rock star in Omaha. And like, I, there's in, like, I could scroll for a minute straight of just DMs from people. Uh, just saying how much they like loved being around you in Omaha. Yeah. So, and that makes it worth it, right? Like that makes yeah. it, and that's the opposite of imposter syndrome. Like you don't want a picture. Like, dude, I'll introduce you to the guys you want for a picture. Like, let me tell you, there's some big ones right there. there. Like, I go tags is hitting right here, guys. This is the greatest college baseball player of all time. So, those interactions were great too. That we jersey swap with Drew Beam. That shout out to Chanel who put up with our shirt. Like that. Was, those were really fun. The CAGs had exchange to see how grateful he was. Like, dude, I'm aware of the brand. Like, I'm like, oh, that's crazy. Get interview Golden Spice guys, Team USA, invited me out to come and interview their boys to kind of raise the branding and, in my opinion, how prolific the war really is and should be treated. We need to talk about that. I forgot yeah, to bring that no. up. I know. Team USA reached out so to sports. you to like interview the Golden Spikes candidates and, uh, yeah. like, Charlie Condon's taking a picture with you and Travis Bazana is talking about uh, like pencil talk. It was so cool to see that. And yeah. uh, so kind of share your experiences there with team USA and the, in the golden spikes. Yeah. My Allison loved it. Gupton is, is awesome. She invited me out, but James Modder and I met each other last year in this event. James was a content guy at South Carolina. He's a big game cock dude. And I always work on team USA. He's so insanely talented that I just wanted to be around him and like absorb knowledge. So they invited me out. I get to come down, right? And it's, it's Hagen Smith and Condon and Mazana. And my the only scripted question I had for all three of them was, hey, if you guys are going to be like all potential top three picks, add CAGs to that mix as well, do you guys do like an arm wrestle or like rock, paper, scissors in order to decide who's going to be number one? Or are you like undercutting it from like a money standpoint? Like you buying each other McDonald's to try to like raise and lower this? They all started laughing. Um, that, that was fun because, you know, Bazana, shout out Los Beeves, all in on the Beaver train now. And what an awesome dude. Like seeing his family there, right? Like you got to think too, there's a little bit of a bittersweet edge for these three highly competitive dudes that they're not playing this event. Yeah. To me, it was more so standing back, taking in the perspective of looking how freaking proud their family are to be in Omaha for Bazana from Sydney, Australia to come this far took a shot to come play in the States. This was his like crowning moment before he goes and plays professional baseball. That was really cool. Charlie Condon's dad was like, I don't know, man. Like, hey, they, they're the, they looked identical, right? But his whole family's there. Hagen Smith's dad has been a listener of the pod since 21, every Monday, driving two hours back and forth from Fayetteville from their hometown. That was wild, right? That so, was crazy when you told me that. Right? Uh, maybe... I texted, oh, yeah, sorry. No, no, no. I was just saying, like, it's just crazy to think that, like, yeah, we put on the show for the players and the coaches, but it's really the families, right? Like, the people that want to know about not only their favorite team or their, like, it could be their son, like, or it could be their cousin or their nephew. And, like, they're the ones listening about it. So, like, that is really cool. Uh, Hagen Smith made me crack up when, uh, when you asked him, like, what was, like, the biggest moment of the season for you? And he kind of just peeked to his right and he was like, uh, against against Oregon State at uh, Globe Life. 
<laughs> that dude, he was so cool about it. I, I wanted to go in and like, you know, Heis, what was the Heisman moment of the year? And there's yep. always that one clip. What was your Golden Spikes moment? Bazana was like, just like winning in Corvallis was super cool. And Condon, like same thing, like changing the face of Georgia baseball. So like the records or whatever, but like that atmosphere for the super was nuts. And then you know, obviously Hagen Smith is like, you know, pitching in front of Hog Faithful for the first time as a starter was really cool. But there was one time and he looked over and they started laughing. I was like, that was our first club, Roma. I remember it yep. well. 17 of 18 was pretty spectacular, brother. 17 strikeouts in six innings, so 18 outs, and he struck out Bazana <laughs> three times. Crazy. Maybe dude. it was four. It might have been four times. I think he might have went over four. I know. I think it was a hat trick because I think he only got him three times because I think they pulled him after like six, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, eight, yeah. So, but uh, yeah, dude, it was. It, that was a really cool thing where like Team USA is reaching out to you asking. So yeah, that was great. Yeah. Um, any any closing thoughts for you? Anything that you just need to get off your chest? Anything that maybe was super cool? Let me ask you this. Did you get to hold the uh, the trophy? I did get to hold the trophy. I did. Get How to much hold does the it trophy? weigh roughly? Dense. Roughly. It's a lot denser than you might think. So last night, I'm obviously, and I. The, the story of Kirby Connell and Xander Seekers goes back to December. So it's like, I'm just like got my arms around their shoulders, just like as they're my boys and we're walking up. And I go, oh, you guys got to duck in for the picture. So they walk in, I hang out. They're like, no, no, you go too. Well, I take my credential off to like, take a picture with the boys. And uh, so I duck in there and the trophy's in there. So uh, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to or if I can, but I did give my best, uh, you know, it was what, Jordan in the shower, head down, repping the brand. He, the photographer looks at me and goes, do you want the pencil in the picture? Or did you forget to take it out of your hand? I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, no. I'll leave it in. Like, just I'll just leave it in if that's okay with you. So <laughs> that'll be pretty funny. Um, I would say I, I, told, I totally forgot. I wanted to put a pin in Cinnamon Toast Crunch. Shout out to Chinook with the Seeds. About 15 minutes before Ben and I jumped on this pod, for those that don't know, I'm living out of an RV right now whose hotspot broke. So I've been bouncing around looking for Wi-Fi. There's a Dunkin' in this Starbucks that's attached to the Marriott where the Tennessee national champion volunteers are staying. Players have walked in and out. I'm like, deucing on bed. Hey, safe flights. Really having a blast at the parade tonight. And I look up from the computer for about two seconds, and the goat looks up at me, comes running over. And Tony Vitello has got a blonde wig on, a national championship hat. He's wearing just a sweet Tennessee pullover, probably home field. And uh, he's got the national championship trophy, dense, heavy, by the way, and a box of cinnamon toast crunch in his left. <laughs> so he puts the. And, and you way, said he was he was holding the cinnamon toast tighter than cinnamon toast crunch tighter than the trophy. He puts the trophy on the ground to dap me up, give him a hug, and is still holding the cinnamon toast crunch like it's his crown jewel. And he's sitting there. He's like, "You mind picking up the big beast for me?" And I was like, "Only in my dreams." So I pick it up and hand it back to him. Fans are starting to pile. He's like, "I gotta get out of here." And I'm like, "Yeah, much love. Like, be good." But I got, I got him with cinnamon toast crunch and the natty. I'm like, "If that's not college baseball, I don't know what is." Like, so well, I mean, there's a good chance he's holding that box of cinnamon toast crunch during the parade tonight. I don't 6 think. PM. I don't think that box has any chance of making it through that flight. I think he's going to crush it. I think I think the coolest coach in, in all of sports is going to be on a, a private charter asking, hey, do you guys have a bowl of milk by any chance? A hundred percent. Oh, man. But uh, I anyways. I Keep reminding me. This is I could do this forever. I feel like I needed to do a better job of documenting it because – well, and it's you funny know. because like you and I have talked uh, like through text message or, or FaceTime or phone call throughout this. So I, I, I can't remember exactly what we said on last podcast or what, what has happened up until now. All I know is the uh, the Teal Ninja was quite the hit. The, <laughs> the RV that just stayed parked out there in the Creighton basketball parking lot. I mean, Go Blue Jays. Go Blue the Jays. real warrior. Now, hopefully it gets you back home safe. That, uh, that's key number one. What is your uh, what does your road trip back look like? When are you leaving? When are you going to be back in Charleston? I, I think people need to educate me here. I don't know. It's like that. Like I'm so hungover from the emotion of an insanely weak, and then also maybe actually a little banged up. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, I'm thinking. Last year I did St. Louis and met up with an old coach. Cardinals and Braves either tonight or tomorrow night. Um, I might just hang out and kind of let it soak in. Do Omaha today and breathe a little bit. Uh, St. Louis tomorrow, Knoxville maybe the next day, 
and then uh, and then Chucktown abound. It's about a 26 hour drive. It's 19 from Charleston to Omaha, but it's about 26 in the Teal Ninja because she's she pushes she's pushing V a little bit. So <laughs> she's purring, purring a little bit. <laughs> the uh, well, whatever we didn't get to today. Uh, we are going to do one more episode later this week, like probably Thursday or Friday when you get back. It'll be a season recap episode. Hopefully by then we'll have uh, an answer on the Texas Longhorns job. That's a big, I mean, who's it going to be? Is it going to be Jim Schlossnagel? Is it going to be David Esker? Is it going to be Waz from Oregon? Like, who knows? Um, I don't think it's going to be Jay Johnson. I, I see that name floating around there. Um, I I could see like a Chris Pollard from Duke. I could see a Dan Fitzgerald from Kansas. Like there's a lot of good candidates, right? Um, but hopefully we'll have an answer on that. And then there's a few other coaching jobs that are going on. Transfer portal will be closing here in about a week, roughly. So no more people will enter. Uh, yeah, we'll, and we'll just do a season recap. We'll talk about favorite moments, favorite players, teams, like this and that. And uh, kind of preview next year a little bit too and, and possibly the draft i want to do one more episode before the draft too i got why a draft just, why don't we just run this thing through the draft brother let's just keep running it through that's a good idea because I, I got a draft listen, board you know? i got a draft board that i'm pretty confident in i like i like the first round a lot yeah and it includes it, in, it it includes blake burke going to the astros yeah. and and starting love, starting at first base September. before september I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I, I love you. I, it's so, if Nolan Shanwell did it, Blake Burke is the most professional. He's the most pro-ready hitter out there, dude. Because if you're drafting Blake Burke, right, you're drafting based off of position, right? Like you need to fit, right? He would fit immediately. And I legitimately think give him a wood battle with him all that or a boat paddle, the dude's going to hit in any stage of the game. Yep. So that it does include Blake Burke to the Astros. Um, but yeah, let's wrap it up there. And uh, we'll be back later this week. And we'll just keep doing the pod throughout the uh, up until the draft. And then hopefully we'll have some, we got some things in the pipeline with coaches interviews that we're going to do in the off season, player interviews, fun things like that. So we're not going to disappear this year. We've disappeared in the past. We just kind of built it to the point where like, we got too much going on where we cannot disappear. I'm not leaving. I'm what does your hat leaving. say? Uh, oh, ma. <laughs> Love that. Oh, dude, Dimitri taught me how to turn it back. So, so if you're watching on YouTube, I, is everything backwards on my end? Yours yeah, but that's it. fine. That's okay. Not that I'm rocking the dad hat. Got yeah. it for Father's Day. Hashtag dad of the year, baby. Shout out Brooks. Brooks Shout is already Brooks. swinging a t-ball bat. He's two. Two and a half. Hey, cl class of 2038, come and see the boy. Let's go. That's well, I guess, saying. no, he'd be class of 2040. Yeah, 2040. Right? Yeah, yeah. Nice. Class of 2040. Get Class of 2040, ready. he might be talking to Coach Vitello or Coach Lossnagel or, or whoever else is up next. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, buddy. See, everybody. We'll be back later this week, I promise.